Good morning, everyone. Anyone have any questions or anything? Good morning, sir. Thank you, Gavin. We're essentially finished with chapter six, but I wanted to give you that intro to uh, gravity as we know it. But uh, actually, I'm going to go quite a bit more since I have the whole class and I won't have uh, the gumption to start into chapter seven with only a 50 minute start. So <laughs> I'm going to have to do it next time. But uh, anyways, this will be a good introduction. That I think we'll, I, I think you'll enjoy it. So anyways, we'll start on chapter seven next time. I've already made tests available for uh, the tests on chapter five and six, and I've made it available uh, until Wednesday. So you can still ask me questions on Monday if you need any. I would suggest and I highly advise you guys to go ahead and take one attempt like immediately today or something, because there's a good chance you might forget if you don't do at least one today, uh, and then you'll get a zero. Uh, I had a couple of people do that last time, even though I gave them the same warning. So. They ended up losing 10 points on their test. I don't want anybody losing any points on their test. You're going to do, uh, you're going to have a chance to lose plenty of points throughout the semester and <laughs> while losing for no reason. Uh, especially when the midterm comes, that's going to be the one that, that's going to be a little harder on you. So you want to get ready and do this. Uh, take it three times. Uh, I only count your, your highest, so should be good to go. I did actually have a question. I was wondering, uh, so, when the uh, block of mass M is given an initial push up a ramp, find the coefficient of kinetic friction. I was wondering like how to approach that question. Yeah, so what you're doing is uh, you're gonna set up a free body diagram uh, for the inclined plane, you tilt the axis where the, maybe the uh, positive oh, axis point. Is on. Go ahead. I don't actually have something to write with right now. Give me a sec. Okay. I think I left it in the car or something. <laughs> and uh, we've got this on video too, so you'll be it'll be recorded and posted today sometime. I've been posting some other things. I got two more videos going up today, uh, so make sure y'all check out my YouTube channel. I've got a better introduction to uh, that air propagation stuff, but uh, both of them I recorded locally. I mean, I recorded in the cloud instead of locally, so the I look, the resolution didn't look bad. I was able on the on the many shots that I looked, I was able to read my handwriting. Uh, so hopefully that'll be That's good. helpful to you. Uh, and of course, it might help to download the actual pages before. That way, you can refer to them for every. All right. So uh, what is it you were saying about the? Uh, so yeah, the, you can uh, take the, the incline, block. and you want to set up a coordinate system. Probably, I would make x go down, positive x axis go down the incline. And you're going to uh, realize that there was a force that got it going. Uh, and, you know, because of that, it's now moving upward, but it's moving against a friction force. And that friction force is going to be mu kinetic times the normal force. And assuming there's no other forces on it acting vertically, then we know the more normal force on an inclined plane is mg cosine theta. So, what, sorry, what was the uh, one step back? <laughs> sorry. Okay. Yeah, the normal force on the incline uh, for a, a mass on an inclined plane, assuming there's no other, you know, strings pulling upward on it. Oh, oh, yeah, mg cosine of just the weight of the block. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Yeah, so it's mg cosine theta. That's a normal force. So that means the friction force is going to be mu kinetic times mg cosine theta, and uh, that's going to be the force that's uh, that's trying to keep it slow down. So it'll actually be acting in the downward direction, as well as the mg sine theta which is the component of gravity parallel to the incline plane. Those two will add up to give you the object's mass times acceleration. So if you know data like how long it takes to get to the top, uh, you can actually compute what the acceleration will be based on mu. And, uh, and there you can solve uh, or, or, and relate it to mu, and then you can solve for mu. Uh, they didn't give us any, um, they didn't actually give us any numbers. It was all just, uh, variables. Yeah. What variables did they give you? Did they give you, I assume they gave you theta. Uh, they no, they actually theta, theta did not, theta did not come into play. Well, no, it, it did. It did. Okay. Um, but it's, it's mu static, mu kinetic mass gravity. And, um, I think at the end of the day, it also, included included 
D, which was the distance that it travels up the ramp before coming to a rest. That, that's what you need, because now you can use V squared minus V zero squared equals two A D. Uh, and that might be enough. You know, the final velocity is zero. Did they give you something that you're supposed to assume is the initial velocity? Um, we did have a V zero, yeah. So now you can say, well, the acceleration is going to be V final squared minus V zero squared over two times D. Uh, and of course that comes out negative, but that's okay uh, because the forces if you put the, actually, if you put the x-axis pointing up the incline, then the forces will be negative already. So you'll have a uh, mg sine theta pointing down the incline. That's the direction of the acceleration. And you'll have a m, uh, mu kinetic mg sine, uh, mg cosine theta pointing down the incline, and that'll be in the negative direction. Those two add, because they're the total forces acting on it, uh, and that's equal to m times a, and you now have a. So you can plug that in and just solve it for mu at that point. Okay. You, you, right, that, thank you. you. Want me to write it down? Would that help you? Uh, no that that does that does okay. help out because I I did I did eventually kind of figure out what was going on. I I I did spend some time looking around on the internet, but uh, but I eventually figured out how to find it. Um, ha having the um the. Uh, I had forgotten about that uh, kinematic equation that you just mentioned. Um, I suspect the mass is going to cancel out, so you won't even need the mass. Yeah, the mass was not part of the final answer. Yeah. yeah uh, ultimately, I think you'll get uh, mu is equal to m times parentheses negative v initial squared. Well, actually, you can drop the negative. Uh, you can say m times v initial squared over 2d uh, minus or, or you know, plus g sine theta, and then all that divided by g cosine theta should be mu. I'll expect, expect that's roughly it. And, and like I said, the words <laughs> are hard to follow, but if you you know pause this when you're watching it, you'll, you'll get a pretty much a an actual accurate description of, of what the answer should be just working that out in my head i'm, I'm sure there's a hundred chances for any error in that but that should do it okay yeah all right so here's the deal we we, we learned on uh excuse me we learned newton's law of gravity and i even told you how uh he came up with the idea of the law of gravity but i didn't explain to you how he was not that happy with it you know and no one has been since they did it specifically because uh, he didn't understand any way that something like the sun could reach out over space and tug on the earth without any tether between them, without any connection. So we had the same problems in electricity uh, and magnetism, for instance, uh, unlike charges attract one another and like charges repel, even though they're not touching each other. And uh, unlike poles of a magnet attract each other and like poles uh, repel again without touching each other. So all these are problems. And in the in all the cases, we, we came up with the idea of a field. So you imagine that the a, a, one of the particular masses or one of the particular charges in the case of uh, electric or uh, mass in the case of, of uh, gravity are one of the north poles or south poles of the magnet. In the case of magnetism, we imagine that they actually alter the space around it and create what's called a vector field. And in that case uh, of electricity, it would be the electric field that is a vector field. And basically every point in space has a vector associated with it. So if you take the point X, Y, Z, you say, okay, yeah, there's a vector there and it has a certain length and a certain direction it's pointing. And basically if you take that length at that particular point and multiply it by the charge you plan to put there then boom out will come the force and in fact the direction of the uh electric field is the direction that the that a positive uh charge will actually go so with that field you have an explanation but it's it, it sort of feels ugly and unctuous because you've just taken the <laughs> taking the extra step of making up something else right a field well, when we did that with uh, basically with electricity and magnetism, we found a lot of principles and, and properties about the field that later came true and made some sense for us to continue thinking that way. For instance, you could see the electric field carrying energy from point to point and stuff like that. 
So we stuck with it and it worked very well for a long time until quantum mechanics came along. Uh, and we still can do the, the vast majority of electrical engineering with regular quantum mechanics. I mean, with regular electricity and magnetism, you don't have to use, uh, you know, a quantum field theory or any of those kind of things to do that. You can, but it's a lot harder. So uh, uh, there's no need to unless you find a difference between what you're getting and, and what uh, what the experiment say shows, in which case maybe you have to look at uh, QED, quantum electrodynamics. We did the same thing with gravity, got a field, and you can make yourself feel a little bit better about that, but it just doesn't work as well as in the case of the electric field, the magnetic field. So uh, Newton knew there was a problem, but he also knew that he could solve a lot of physics problems, which again, the word physics wasn't invented yet or wasn't being used yet, uh, not for that anyways, <laughs> uh, but he, he knew there was a problem because of this action at a distance, something reaching out over space. But he just stuck with it and said, you know, I'm not going to be able to solve that problem right now, but I can, I can certainly use this law of gravity that I've come up with to do things. And in fact, you can probably run the Apollo mission easily with just Newton's law of gravity. Your time pieces will be off a little bit uh, because general relativity makes corrections to that that are relevant when we're doing GPS satellite stuff. So if you really want precise locations, you're going to have to still use general relativity to sift that out. But in, in general speaking, uh, Newton's laws of mechanics and uh, Newton's law of gravity will get you to the moon and back, no problem. Okay. Now, along comes Einstein. So Einstein was a big fan of a guy named, by the name of James Clark Maxwell. And James Clark Maxwell, though dying at a very young age, he was a brilliant, brilliant mind. I would say one of those people that we put up there with the uh, Einsteins and Newtons of the world. Okay. And in fact, I'd also put, you know, at least uh, to some extent, Oliver Heaviside, who, who made it Maxwell's equations to make sense to the world. But uh, Maxwell basically died at a young age from a horrible case of stomach cancer. I think he was like in his upper 30s, low 40s, just like his mother had, in fact. But he was well respected, except for his electricity and magnetism. When he died, uh, everybody sort of thought it was a little crazy what he did. Uh, and, and part of that was he had written it in quaternion form and another form. Uh, both of which were really cumbersome and, and hard to follow. And quaternions aren't used very much anymore. Uh, occasionally, somebody will write a paper about it, but they were invented by a guy by the name of Hamilton. And uh, what, what Heaviside did was he took Maxwell's book and just read it. And having no real, not a lot of formal education, he actually was friggin' brilliant and, and figured out vector calculus. And he was greatly responsible for a big chunk of vector calculus that we use today. But he translated uh, new, uh, Maxwell's equations into vector calculus, and that's what made people be able to adopt it and accept it. So Maxwell had written these wonderful four equations, and in fact, he, he had taken experiments that other people had done. In fact, the, according to him, what he did was he went and found a book at, as the occasion chair of mathematics at, at, at uh, Cambridge, the same position Newton held. The same position uh, Dirac held, and Dirac is the person that that suggested that antimatter exists and he did so based on a, a equation he took the quantum mechanics equation the schrodinger equation and made an equivalent version but that was consistent with special relativity and that was called dirac equation the dirac equation and it turned out to be really right but initially everybody said well it's got negative energies that that's unphysical and he said no my equation's right uh there must exist some matter uh called antimatter and those negative energies just correspond to that uh, in other words, I'm so confident about my mathematics that I'm going to invent a whole other piece of matter. And he said, we basically, basically should be able to find electrons with positive charges and protons with negative charges, but everything else be about the same. And sure enough, we did. So that's, that's the kind of guy that's held the Cajun chair of mathematics, Newton, Maxwell, Dirac, uh, most recently Stephen Hawking until he died. And then Ed Witten took it over and Ed Witten is one of the co-inventors of string theory another brilliant, uh, very, very intelligent person. So Maxwell uh, had this position and he had done a lot of great things in thermodynamics. He did models that helped us understand how molecules and atoms behave, even before we knew for a fact that atoms and molecules existed. Uh, I say for a fact, we haven't proven it, in other words, uh, by experiment. And uh, he had also was the first one to tell us what the rings of Saturn were made of. So he did a lot of good stuff, but in the electricity field, he didn't get it. Come 1900s, though, uh, you know, he, he died, I think, in 1960s, roughly, or maybe in the 1950s, but, or excuse me, 1850s, 1860s. But come the 1900s, when Einstein's going through school, uh, everybody knows Maxwell's equations are the bomb, and Einstein studies them. So Einstein's studying them, 
And it, there's a special thing you can do. You can look on my YouTube channel. I actually do this derivation for you. You can put together uh, Maxwell's few, uh, equations uh, in such a way that you make a wave equation. And a wave equation has a very specific form. It's like a second order derivative with respect to X or space or something like that equals one over V squared times a special uh, times a second order derivative in time. And that V is the velocity of the wave. And that if you ever have a differential equation like that, then you know it's a wave equation. And uh, he was able to do that with his equations, uh, even in that god awful form that he was working them. And when he did so, it was uh, patently obvious that the velocity of that wave turned out to be the speed of light. And it was based on two parameters that didn't seem to be that much related to each other, but definitely not related to light. So at that instant, he sort of is the person that knows exactly what light is. And he says that light is an uh, electromagnetic field, electric field, if you will, oscillating, say, vertically. It can actually oscillate in any direction, but once you establish that, then the other two directions are set. So if the electric field is oscillating vertically and the magnetic field is oscillating horizontally, then mutually perpendicular to both of those, following a right-hand rule, uh, the electromagnetic radiation travels in that third direction, which would be direct to you, okay? So basically E, if E is like this, B is my index finger, I'm using my right hand here. B, uh, A is my index finger, E the electric field is my index finger, B the, like, the magnetic field is my middle finger, and then uh, the direction of velocity is my thumb. And that's the way electromagnetic radiation works. That's the way uh, light is a wave. That's what that's what light is it, in some sense. We later worry about it quantum mechanically when we find something else. But right now, that's plenty. Okay. So Einstein studies these four equations and looks at it and realizes all these paradoxes come out. He says, "Well, it's, if you take that wave equation and you transform it to another coordinate system, maybe a coordinate system moving at half the speed of light, uh, it doesn't change." And if you move it to a coordinate system moving at 99% of the speed of light, it still doesn't change. And that presented a lot of paradoxes to him. And, and you know, you should probably read sometime some of the things he said about it. And we're going to go into relativity, special relativity this semester anyway, so you'll get your chance. But doing that, he said, well, I, I, I think that we need to redo physics. So he basically just took Maxwell's equations at face value and said, the only way I can make sense of Maxwell's equations not being transformed when I go from one coordinate system to another even at great velocities, is to assume that the speed of light is a constant. So in 1905, Einstein publishes like six or seven papers, probably five of which could have won him the Nobel Prize, one of which did, by the way. Uh, and one of the papers that he wrote was uh, this paper on special relativity. And in it, he said the laws of physics are the same for all inertial observers. So that's like one principle. But that inertial observer sounds kind of weird. And what he means by that, uh, though it's not always obvious, uh, what he means is if you see a field that is obviously uh, obeying either Galileo's law of inertia or Newton's first law of motion, i.e. objects aren't uh, slowing down without an obvious force acting on it, and objects aren't speeding up or changing direction without obvious force on it. If that's the case, then it's an inertial frame. But if you see a case where something is turning, speeding up, or slowing down without an obvious force on it, then it's a non-inertial reference frame. And for instance, if you just look, you know, from way up high above the North Pole of the Sun, back down on our solar system, you will see that planets are actually orbiting the Sun with no obvious force acting on it. In other words, you don't see a thing touching a thing, so you can't see any necessary force, but you're seeing the planets accelerate. So he was using that, that uh, inertial reference frame as a way to say that uh, I'm ignoring gravity. So that's why it was called special relativity because it was a special case in which there was no gravity. So that's his first principle. Then the second principle is one I just told you, which is the speed of light is a constant independent of the motion of the source or the observer. So, you know, if you took a professional baseball pitcher and put him on a flatbed uh, Mack truck trailer and the flatbed Mack, Mack truck trailer is driving at 60 miles per hour and the professional pitcher standing on that flatbed truck uh, throws a hundred mile per hour fastball in the same direction the truck's going, then if you're out there on the road in front of the Mack truck, you see the Mack truck coming at you at 60 miles per hour, and then you see the ball coming at you at 160 miles per hour because that's just the way velocity's at. Well, that's the way velocity's at, except for that special case of the speed of light. So if instead, uh, let's say the Mack truck is traveling at three-fourths the speed of light, okay, 
And then the uh, baseball player throws a ball that's at three fourths the speed of light. You would think that'd be coming at you at one and a half times the speed of light because three fourths plus three fourths is 1.5 or, or three halves, right? So uh, that's not what happens either. Either it actually goes still less than the speed of light. So uh, they don't add the same way, obviously, when you're dealing with speeds close to the speed of light. And Einstein provides a formula for that for us, and we'll see that later in special relativity. But the other weird thing is if the if the baseball player instead of throwing a ball actually shoots a beam of light at us while traveling on the back of the Mack truck traveling at three quarters of the speed of light, we would still measure the Mack truck moving at us at three quarters of the speed of light, and the light beam would still be moving at the speed of light. Period. And in fact, if the Mack truck driver measured the speed of the light beam that left in front of his cab, he would measure it as the speed of light. And if the guy, the pitcher, measured the speed at which is a beam of light was leaving his flashlight, he would determine it to be the speed of light. And in fact, if the if the person that was you know in front of the Mack truck and the baseball player all of a sudden started running at half the speed of light towards the Mack truck, he would still see the light beam coming at him at the speed of light. So it's really, really an absurd idea. But from that, you, you get that since speed is, is distance divided by time, uh, in order to keep that speed a constant, if space changes, then time's got to change. Because if you change the distance a little bit, the, the ratio of distance to time still has to be C, that 300 million meters per second or 186,000 miles per second. So uh, that fixes C uh, distance and time as if they can change. OK, but one can't change without the other one changing. So that's where we end up getting uh, things like time dilation, length contraction, which we'll learn about later. Now, when Einstein goes to uh, do his general theory of relativity, it took him another 10 years. He had to learn the mathematics uh, of vector calculus and calculus on manifolds and stuff like that, because he knew he wanted to generalize that first principle of relativity, which said uh, the laws of physics are the same for all inertial observers. In general relativity, that principle comes the laws of physics are the same for all observers, period, okay? To get rid of that, he had to address what was thought to be an, a non-inertial reference frame. And what he did was him and other people had discovered various principles, and one of them is the equivalence principle. And the equivalence principle basically just says, uh, if you're in a really soundproof elevator uh, car and you're sitting on the surface of the earth, but you have no windows, so you don't know that, and you drop a ball, you would reach the conclusion that you're sitting on the surface of the Earth or some planet just like it because the ball dropped at 9.8 meters per second every second and went straight down. However, the equivalence principle says that's exactly the same. And as long as you deal on a small scale, you can't prove it any otherwise if the uh, uh, elevator car was instead actually accelerating upward way far away from any gravitational sources, but was just accelerating up at, at 9.8 meters per second every second. Because in that case, if you let go of the ball, the ball's inertia says, hey, I want to stay right here going this speed that I am right now. Well, the rocket's actually accelerating upward at 9.8 meters per second per second. So in that frame, we see the ball accelerating downward at 9.8 meters per second per second. So that is the way he ultimately was able to make sense of gravity. He imagined it as there's no difference between an acceleration and a gravity uh, and a gravitational force. And what I mean by a small scale is you can imagine if you made the elevator car that we were talking about, if you made it where it's so wide that maybe it's comparable to the diameter of the Earth, then you sitting in the middle wouldn't be able to tell uh, whether you're accelerating or gravity uh, or gravity's acting on you because the ball would uh, accelerate at 9.8 meters per second per second. But over here at this end, this person could tell because if he was accelerating upward, the ball would go straight down. But since he's way out here over the earth and lined up with the edge of the earth, the ball is going to actually fall this way. So he can detect that. So on a large scale, yeah, you can tell the difference between acceleration and gravity because gravity pulls everything towards a common center, whereas acceleration pulls everything straight down in the opposite direction it's going. And a, a test for this, by the way, is really neat. Uh, try taking a helium filled balloon in a safe way now uh, and attach it somewhere in your car where it's not touching the ceiling and it's not touching a seat or anything like that and, and tie it down, but allow it to float and then hit the accelerator forward on your vehicle. And unlike your body and your head that goes like back like this, 
the uh, actual helium filled balloon will lean forward. When you're taking off forward, it leans forward because helium filled balloons do the opposite of gravity. They always go the opposite way gravity is. Well, the helium filled balloon feels like gravity is pulling backwards and pulling down. So it goes this way. That's basically showing you that the equivalence principle is a real thing. So when he did that, he was able to, in 1915, publish his uh, general theory of relativity, and he gave a system of equations. Let me show you those field equations real quick, just, just for completeness. I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to go to, I think this one will do. Okay, so there's that screen. And now I should be able to, here you go. here's Einstein's field equations. So this is, a, a, it's, well, I can give you a nice analogy. You know how easy it was to solve linear equations. Uh, like uh, 3x plus 4 equals 3, right? You can easily solve that. When you end up getting like 2x squared minus 3x plus 7 equals 0, that's called a nonlinear equation. And you can use the, the uh, uh, um, quadratic formula on that one. Or if it's higher order, you can go through those techniques, you know, looking for zeros and all that good stuff. And then, uh, then you can solve it as well. But you can see the nonlinear is harder than the linear. Well, this is a nonlinear partial differential equations. So differential equations are nasty. Partial differential equations are slightly more nasty. Nonlinear partial differential equations are even more nasty. And then to make matters worse, initially, this is really like 16 different equations, but it's symmetric. So we can end up getting it down to about uh, six equations total. But still, you've got not only an equation, you've got a system of coupled equations, and they're nonlinear, and they're uh, uh, partial differential equations. So they're really a, a nightmare to solve. And Einstein came across saying, basically, you know, I, I, I suspect that we might not get a solution to these equations for centuries. Uh, but a guy on the battlefield of World War I at the time, guy named, by the name of, uh, uh, dang it, I just lost his name. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, a guy by the name of, why am I losing his name? Sore shield, excuse me, sore shield. So a guy by the name of Shore Shields on uh, literally on the battlefield, sees Einstein's publication, solves it immediately using a lot of symmetry. And that gives us an, our idea of the black hole immediately. And in fact, it's not that special a uh, black hole. Uh, in fact, all of them, uh, the earth and all these things sort of act like that solution that Sore Shield found uh, under high symmetry. It's just, if you go to a certain point uh, in that equation, in that uh, system that, that Sore Shield found, uh, then you can't retreat anymore. In other words, you can't get out of the, the body of gravity. So in, in that case, it's uh, it's like a black hole. There's an event horizon across which you pass. You can't get there. Now, if you make the Earth the size small enough that the event horizon can actually be reached, then the Earth is essentially a black hole. So that was what his 1905 uh, paper gave us was all this. And he made some predictions and he made some data uh, that was really helpful because, for instance, we knew some things that Newton's gravity wasn't doing right, one of which was the fact that the perihelion of Mercury, so if you imagine the perihelion, remember, is basically where the uh, Sun and Mercury is closest. Well, that thing seems to wobble around like this. In other words, it should always be, well, actually, that's the Sun. <laughs> so it should always be that Mercury does this number and comes back here. Right, but Mercury's got some level of perturbation that's making it jack up. So it comes back here, and then it's over here the next time, and then it comes back here. And so it's doing like a kaleidograph or that spiral thing you had maybe when you were a kid, where you had spirals inside of spirals, and uh, it's called a spirograph. It, it does like that, and it's called the precession of the perihelion of, of Mercury. And Newton's equations gave us a a. a gave us a estimate of what that should be and it was off by almost a factor of 50 percent roughly when einstein used his field equations or his learnings of general relativity he was able to get exactly the right answer what what we had found out experimentally so that was really good another thing he did is he checked in the case in which uh newton's laws of gravity work really well he found out that his general theory of relativity matched newton's laws of gravity so that gave him another hint that yeah we're on the right track you know if you if you found something that violated uh newton's laws of physics where uh when it was in the realm where newton's laws of physics work then you have to throw it out or at least say our my equation is not valid in that area and no one would like that they want a comprehensive theory that takes into account all the stuff we knew before that's called uh 
correspondence principle that came up that Bohr came up with during quantum mechanics discovery. So Einstein was able to do that. And then further on, he said, imagine, or let's wait for an eclipse and then imagine a star in the distance. So you imagine say the sun's here and a star is back here and we're down here looking, okay? Well, this star is gonna emit light that way and that way and that way, every direction. And in fact, if it's directly behind the sun, we won't even see it. But if that star emits its light, say this direction, and then the gravity of the sun bends it and comes to us this way, we'll look and see the sun from this eye point and I mean, see the star uh, during that eclipse and it will appear the star is way over there instead of here. And that difference in angle from where it is to where it's supposed to be, Einstein was able to calculate and he said, go out during the eclipse and look at a star uh, near the sun at the time that the sun's having the eclipse and you will see it moved a certain number of arc seconds. And he calculated that. Well, luckily the first uh, mission, this was going on, like I said, during World War I, uh, the first mission uh, didn't pan out. So they had a lot of teams going out to, to photograph and test Einstein's general theory of relativity. And like one group got caught by literally human headhunters <laughs> or cannibal type people uh, because they were in this you know, wilderness, I think in, it was either South America or it might've been Africa, uh, I'm not sure. But that was one group got captured by that. Another group got captured by the non-allied forces and were suspected of being spies. And some other fo folks had bad weather. So basically, no one got to get that test done, the first uh, eclipse after 1915. But luckily, that was good for Einstein because he found out he, he sort of forgot to carry the one or something. But basically, he had, he had made a calculation error. And since that time, he corrected it and said, no, it should move by this much. So that still put him predicting it before the experiment came in, which is a good thing. So it turns out uh, later after 1915, a guy by the name of Arthur Eddington, which by the way, at the time, 1915, 1916, there's really two people that knew about the general theory of relativity and that's Arthur Eddington and the guy who invented it, uh, uh, Einstein. So uh, Eddington had written this, this book and it's actually still really a good textbook on learning general relativity. And he was the uh, astronomer Royale or the Royal Astronomer for Great Britain. And he went out and, and tested Einstein's general theory of relativity and got back and the results were right on the money. Einstein was perfectly correct. Uh, the New York Times, if I remember correctly, I think it was New York Times ran the headline, uh, God said, let there be light and Einstein told it how to move or something like that. So Einstein became famous all over the world instantly uh, around 1916, right? Uh, uh, Jay Leno made a joke one time because uh, uh, Michael Beschloss or Isaac, Walter Isaacson, one of those two, uh, wrote a biography. I have it, so I should have looked that up, but I didn't. A biography of Einstein, and in it, he discovered that that shortly thereafter, the 1916s to 1920 era, Einstein at one time had 12 mistresses. And you know, Einstein's not all that pretty, so you're like, how's that? But anyways, uh, Jay Leno made the joke and said. God, could you imagine keeping up with 12 mistresses? Oh, that would be so hard to keep from, you know, making a mistake. You'd have to be a, oh, yeah, yeah, he's a genius. <laughs> so I, I thought that joke was kind of funny. But anyways, Einstein did uh, did become famous, not just in the scientific community, which he was already, already pretty famous in, uh, but now he's uh, famous to the common people. And in fact, they started asking questions about everything. I told you earlier about how they asked him about ESP, uh, telekinesis and stuff like that. And he said, if you show me the base of one over R squared law, then I'll believe it. Uh, that, you know, that's the kind of stuff you get asked once you become quote unquote, a genius in the realm of, of, of anything. They're gonna assume you're a genius in the realm of everything. So they asked him when he was over in Great Britain, you know, trying to get a, a, a good word in for Arthur Eddington. They said, uh, so Arthur, uh, Professor Einstein, what do you think of, of uh, Eddington? He said, well, He's a smart enough fellow, but he's not a very good scientist. And they're like, what the heck? And <laughs> basically he said, well, I say he's not that good of a scientist because uh, when he was testing my general theory of relativity, uh, he stayed up all night worrying about whether I was right or whether I was wrong. But I slept like a baby because I knew if I was wrong, God was wrong. So that was, again, this arrogance that you see. And, and it's not as mean as it sounds to to most God believing people or whatever. Uh, it, it's not as mean as it sounds because specifically Einstein didn't see God as like a necessarily a creature or a person in any sort of the, of the word. 
uh, he saw, he believed in the God of Spinoza. So if you read the works of Baruch Spinoza, uh, you'll get a, a sense of what it is. But it's a, basically a God that that you cannot disprove. In fact, he, he's, he's got it, that God got, has to exist. So Einstein's saying it's respect for sort of the laws of physics or the laws of nature or something like that. That's what Einstein views as, as God. And he just couldn't imagine a scenario in which he would not see uh, some way to explain his science other than his way. Uh, so he was, you know, basically cognizant that he was 100% right. And, and he was essentially. Now, what he did screw up was at the time we had no evidence to suggest the universe was expanding. And Einstein believed the universe was like it is now and always was like that and will always be like that. He didn't believe in a big changing universe. And he believed in a clockwork universe, sort of like Newton taught us. That if you know all the conditions on anything, you can predict anything that's going to happen to it in the future. So he believed in that kind of physics. And that overrode whatever his equations would tell him at any time. So when he was writing his general theory of relativity, the general theory of relativity is sort of yelling at him saying, hey, the universe is expanding, the universe is expanding. And he sort of saw it as, hey, the universe is collapsing, the universe is collapsing. So he put in the fudge factor to, to account for what hadn't been seen yet, which was the expansion or contraction of the universe. And it's called the cosmological constant. And that cosmological constant, he said, was his greatest blunder. The reason being is uh, shortly thereafter, an observation was made that, that did show the universe was expanding. But before that, it was kind of neat because a guy by the name of Alexander Friedman, who was a Russian, and uh, you know, if you know your history a little bit, Russia was not that good of a place to be doing science articles at that point in time because they were having their own sort of revolution, if you will. And they were sort of a backwater, uh, sort of like America's were in the uh, 1800s. So being a backwater like that, you could write a paper and publish it and then no one would see it. And that was what happened with Alexander Friedman. He'd written a paper basically showing that Einstein's uh, general relativity predicted the expansion of the universe. And if the universe is expanding, that would imagine that would cause you to imagine that in the past, the universe was, uh, in fact, very, very small. And in fact, smaller, to say, than a nucleus of an atom even. So that's where we start to get the ideas of the Big Bang as the universe was created out of nothingness and uh, in, in, in what we call a Big Bang, which was, you know, sort of an oxymoron in that it's not big and there was no, uh, there was only a vacuum, so you couldn't hear any sound, so there wouldn't be a bang either. But anyways, that, that name stuck. It was actually named by a person that didn't believe in it, a guy by the name of Fred Hoyle. So he predicted that, but again, nobody saw it. Then another guy by the name of George Lemaitre, he, he actually turned out uh, to be a, a Jesuit priest, and he did the same thing with Einstein's equation and found out that, you know, that Einstein's equations were telling us the universe was expanding. So he sent his work to Einstein, and Einstein reportedly wrote back and said, uh, your, your mathematics is, is right, but your physics is abominable. In other words, Einstein said, I don't care what my equations are saying, and your math and my equations are saying that, but my physics, my understanding of God, the universe, nature, is that the universe exists as it is now and always has existed that way. So that was Einstein sort of refuting it. And like I said, he was, he was just dead wrong because uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Hubble makes the observation using uh, research by Henrietta Swan Leavitt. So this Henrietta Swan Leavitt had shown looking at uh, certain type of stars called Cepheid variables that their uh, brightness varies like this and in fact their luminosity which is how much radiation they put out uh, which is easily related to the brightness as long as you know the distance away uh, that luminosity was also pulsating like that and she sh showed that if you knew the amount of time between peaks of, of brightness and luminosity then you could tell how massive the star was and exactly how much luminosity it had so that would give you a way to look at a seafood variable over a period of time map its oscillating brightness, count the or calculate the amount of time for the period of the brightness to change and use that to determine the luminosity of the star. And then, of course, here at Earth, where we can easily measure the brightness because that's just how many photons are hitting the square centimeter of, of film, say. And if you have the luminosity and the brightness, then you can use that as a standard candle to find the distance away. So Henrietta Swan Leavitt had come up with this and then Hubble used that and uses, uh, the, I think, the Palomar Observatory and he basically looked at what we then called the Andromeda Nebula. 
And what he discovered was there's a CFID variable in the Andromeda Nebula, and he used that to determine how far away it was. And it turned out to be way farther away, even though he got it wrong because the data wasn't that great at the time. Uh, it was way farther away than we imagined our universe even being. So what he realized was the Andromeda Nebula was in fact another island of stars, another galaxy, and that it was maybe hundreds of thousands of light years away. Turns out it's 2.5 million light years away, uh, but that's all because our, our data on uh, CFE variables wasn't that great yet. Henrietta Swan Levitt nailed the prediction. It's just her data wasn't that great yet because we didn't have the technology we do uh, we did later or we do now. So anyways, he did find that. And what he also found was that he found a bunch of nebula that turned out to be galaxies like that. And he discovered that if you know if you find one uh, galaxy that's say 100 million parsecs away, it might be moving at 100 meters per second away from us. And if you find another one at 200 megaparsecs away, that one's going to be moving at 200 meters per second. If you find another one 10 uh, megaparsecs away, then that one would be moving at 1,000 meters per second. And in fact, he also found that if you did the same thing from any other galaxy, uh, you would find the same result. And that is what led to the idea of the Big Bang existing, OK? Because the only way we can make sense of that is not the galaxies are moving through space, but that the space itself is expanding. So you have to sort of think of it as uh, uh, raisins in a raisin bread, you know, when you make the dough and you lay it out and it rises. It's not so much that the individual raisins are moving through the dough. It's that the space between the raisins is filled with dough and that dough is expanding. And that's what the Big Bang is. It's the universe itself is expanding. And when we say the universe, we mean all the matter, all the energy, all the dark matter, all the dark energy, and the space itself. That's the most important point, <laughs> okay? Because most people think space existed with nothing in it, because obviously it would, right? And then there was an explosion out of which one little point in space, all the matter came. That's not what the Big Bang is, but that's what most people think the Big Bang is. It's not, though, okay? If that was the case, you could trace back all those velocities and they would all point to one point in space as if the, back, the Big Bang occurred at that point in space, but that's not what we see. As I told you, everybody thinks they're the center of the universe. No, other, no matter what galaxy you go to, you're gonna find all of those galaxies around it moving with the same law that Hubble found, the Hubble law, which says if an object, if a galaxy is twice as far away, it's going to move twice as far, uh, fast away from you, okay? So the Big Bang is actually the idea that the universe, the space and everything came out of nothingness and it's not necessarily in anything. We don't think it's in anything and it's expanding, okay? That was the Big Bang. Well, in the meantime, uh, this uh, uh, Jesuit priest, George Lemaitre, uh, his idea got some traction. George Gamow loved it. And Gamow's written a, a bunch of books for laymen for physics. And he's this Russian immigrant that ended up being here in the United States and was really, really brilliant. I mean, he's a brilliant man, but he's not that good of a theoretical physicist in that he couldn't do a lot of the hard mathematical work, but he still was very brilliant and, and explained a lot of really complicated things to people through layman books. But he happened to be working with a student by the name of Ralph Alpher and actually... Let me show you this. I'm going to share screen for a second. So he worked with Ralph Alpher and Robert Herman as the advisor to Ralph Alpher. This is Alpha right here. And that's Herman. That's George Gamow in the middle. This book is great, by the way. And it's, it's small, but the it actually has an appendix written by Ralph Alpher, who only died like in 2000, I want to say 2012 or something like that. But Ralph Alpher shows in the appendix exactly the calculations he did on the Big Bang. And he did this as his uh, PhD thesis, basically. So uh, that's a great book, The Genesis of, of the Big Bang uh, by Ralph uh, Alpher. But anyways, Alpher was at Union College up in New York, the same college that Barbara Streisand went to. So anyways, uh, this guy, uh, Ralph Alpher, under the tutelage, if you will, of, of George Gamow, had worked out the details of the Big Bang. And he used like what we now know as the percentage of hydrogen and helium, or what we then knew as the percentage of hydrogen and helium, to sort of gauge everything. Fred Hoyle had begin, uh, and discovered this idea of nucleosynthesis, where uh, stars go through a life time and then explode and give off their guts and have created other elements beyond hydrogen and helium. 
And what Ralph Alpher was able to calculate was that we'd only get hydrogen and helium and maybe a little bit of lithium. We now know we can get hydrogen, helium, lithium, and a little bit of beryllium uh, from the Big Bang, but that's really the only elements you can get from the Big Bang. And he was able to use that and what we currently knew about uh, hydrogen and helium to predict the uh, prevalence of all the other elements. And he, he actually got it right. Like he, he said, yeah, this is, you know, we expect this much hydrogen, this much helium. We knew that already. And that causes us to have this much lithium, this much beryllium, this much carbon, so on and so forth. And it turns out that's, that's really right on the money. So he was able to do that. He was also able to show that basically the Big Bang started as an infinitesimally small thing. Uh, space started to expand. And he predicted that we pitch black because initially the temperatures were so high, the energy so high that uh, only uh, elementary particles could exist. So for instance, you had electrons because they're an elementary particle, and, but you didn't have protons and neutrons because they are not elementary particles. You'd have quarks running around as well. And since they're running around freely, they can absorb every bit of energy that you throw at it. It doesn't have a specific energy that it can't take. So all the light that's being uh, emitted in whatever wavelength is being absorbed by all these particles. So it's pitch black. And as it expands, he just used basically the ideal gas law to show, you know, as volume goes up, temperature goes down. And he realized there was a point at which you get a low enough temperature where the quarks would stick to the quarks and make neutrons and protons. And then at a low enough temperature still, you could actually find a point where the electrons would get attached to the neutrons or, or the nuclei and stuff like that. And in fact, all you really get, like I said, was hydrogen and helium. So you really only get uh, a case of a single proton with an electron sort of orbiting it, or the case of two protons and two neutrons with an electron orbiting it. So that's hydrogen and helium. And he was able to predict that and, and know roughly uh, at what temperature that, that would occur, because when that occurs, the energy is quantized so that only very specific wavelengths can be absorbed. So what that meant is all that radiation now that's being put out, only certain bits of it can be absorbed by the matter instead of all of it, which could be absorbed by the matter before. So that made an, a, a, an instant flash of light that would come out. And that flash of light would be a characteristic of the temperature of the Big Bang at that time. So if you make a graph of uh, frequency or wavelength on the bottom, on the bottom axis versus uh, amount of radiation, on the top, you get this hump that looks like this. And that hump, that peak, is a uh, corresponds to the wavelength at which you see the brightest, OK? Well, that wavelength is directly related to temperature uh, by something called Wien's law, W-E-I-N apostrophe S law. And when you do that, you say, OK, well, I know exactly what that wavelength of light was at that instant because I knew the temperature of the universe. So Alpha was able to calculate that temperature and that wavelength, and then he realized uh, by this point in time, the universe has expanded this amount. So that wave length that might have been maybe this long is now this long, right? And he calculated exactly how long that would be and then used Wien's law to determine what temperature that would be. And he said it should be around 2.7 Kelvin. Uh, you should find a peak in radiation. And it should come from everywhere. So he predicted all that stuff, predicted the, the percentages of matter. He predicted this microwave background radiation. All that stuff was predicted. And uh, Gamma was known as this cool, funny joker guy who liked to play pranks. And he said, there's no way I'm letting this publication go by with uh, Ralph Alpher and George Gamma, which sounds like Gamma, without a beta in there. So he called Hans Beth, uh, who many people referred to as beta, and asked if he put his name on it. And he said, I didn't do anything. I don't want my name on that paper. He said, oh, don't worry about it. It's a great paper. It's fine. And the student doesn't mind. He thinks it's a funny joke, too. Uh, and then Beta said, OK, yeah, that's fine. So it got published as the Alpha Beta Gamma paper. Well, nobody read it <laughs> because they thought it was just, you know, Gamma off joking again. So poor Ralph Alpha, who really should have, in my opinion, won a Nobel Prize for making this prediction, didn't win the Nobel Prize. OK, so the people at the UC Berkeley group who had been working with with uh, Hoyle, uh, Bob Wilson and or excuse me, uh, Bob Christie, excuse me, yeah, Bob Christie and Fred Hoyle and all these, they were looking for this microwave background radiation and they had built a microwave antenna, but it was really small. Well, Bell Labs had a really big one at the time and two guys, uh, Bob Wilson and Arno Pincius, were working on that, trying to do the future of communications. In other words, trying to make cell phones like we have now possible and stuff like that. And they had this huge microwave antenna 
and they were trying to test what the uh, what the atmosphere was doing to it. So, like, and they kept getting this eerie, stupid radiation coming from every direction. They thought it was big uh, bird droppings in the in the antenna. They thought it might have been nearby spacecraft. Uh, they might uh, they thought it might have been nearby airplanes and and stuff like that. So they did all this work and they just couldn't get rid of it. Well, one of them happened to read an article in an astronomy magazine because it turns out uh, Wilson, for instance, was a physicist, as was Arne Penzias, and he saw that they were looking for exactly that radiation. And he published it and said, hey, we found this microwave background radiation, and it turned out to be exactly what Alfred said. But, of course, Wilson and, and Penzias had not read Alfred's paper. So they win the Nobel Prize for finding uh, the microwave background radiation, uh, and poor Ralph Alfred's left in the cold. But what Einstein's gravity actually did tell us, by the way, is that the universe itself uh, doesn't have a gravitational for force, but it is four dimensional. It has X, Y, like left, right. Uh, so X say left and right, Y say in and out, and Z say up and down. That's three perpendicular directions. He said there's a fourth perpendicular direction. We call it time. And that what's really happening is the mass causes space and that four dimensions to pucker, not unlike a bowling ball and a trampoline, which is normally the example you use. And if you take a, uh, say a marble or a BB and roll it on that trampoline towards the dimple, but not towards the actual ball, it'll go in and rotate around and, or actually revolve around and around and around that ball until the friction wears off, uh, wears it down and, and it falls to the ball. So that's what the planets are doing. They're going as straight as they can in a warped space. Uh, Misner, Thorne and Wheeler in their biblical version of gravity is a book called Gravitation. It's sort of the Bible of relativity for the 1970s. Uh, they said that uh, space, or excuse me, matter tells space how to bend and space tells matter how to move. And that's really the best explanation of what the general theory of relativity is. It's basically saying that this, there's no force of gravity. There's just a bend in space that causes things to move differently. And that's it. I've done the whole lecture and given you more than enough information about uh, not only general relativity, but special relativity and cosmology as we know it. So you guys are free to go. I will see you on Monday. Don't forget to try your test and have a good one. Ran about two minutes over. <laughs>